Last week, the 2018 United Nations Climate Change Conference, known as COP24, wrapped up in Katowice, Poland. It was the first meeting since the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's 2018 report warned of catastrophic environmental impacts if the world fails to meet the targets set by the 2015 Paris Agreement. Courtney Howard is board president of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. She's also the co-author of the 2018 Lancet Countdown Report. She attended COP24 in Poland and joins us now on what, if anything, was accomplished. Dr. Howard, good to have you in that chair. Hi, how are you? I'm just grand, thank you very much. Let's just, um, let's start with some background. How did you get so interested in the intersection between climate change and health? So I'm an emergency doctor and I wanted to work with Doctors Without Borders. And when you want to work with Doctors Without Borders, I say, okay, you're Canadian, go to the North. So I went to the North and uh, I was on my way out for a locum in December and I needed some reading material because it's quiet there in December and it's good to have something to read. And so I bought a book on climate change actually on my way up through the Edmonton airport and I had a fair bit of time to read it. And by the time I was done, I was like, oh my gosh. And it just turned out that was just a little while after the Lancet had put out a report saying that climate change was the biggest health threat of the 21st century. So I was actually by myself in Inuvik doing a literature review. And it turns out when you ask around that Inuvik is already three degrees Celsius warmer than it was in the 1950s. And so people are having trouble. Uh, ice is less stable, so it's more difficult to hunt for food. Hmm. Um, people are more likely to go through the ice. Uh, so there's the potential for trauma and the rapidly changing landscape um, it's upsetting if you can imagine growing up in a place that looked one way and then, you know, the permafrost starts to melt on incline, so they're getting landslides, uh, trees, they're called drunken forests, where the permafrost sort of um, melts a little bit and the roots from the tree kind of soften and the trees mm. tip over. Well, you didn't grow so up things, there, but you, you, you live in the, Yellowknife now. Yeah, these so are the stories. Yeah, these are the stories that people hear you tell you. So, you know, as an eMERGE doc, you, you, you speak with everybody coming in and sometimes you have time while you're suturing someone up and they just, you know, you say, hey, what did you do last week? And they said, oh, I went hunting where my father has always had his traps and, you know, the lake's not actually frozen there the way they usually are. And you know, it's, things are changing a lot. So particularly our indigenous population who's been up there for millennia mm. and have strong oral traditions uh, letting us know what has happened uh, previously, they, they've really noted changes and that's been backed up since by research. And the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, that's the group you're the head of, what's, uh, what's their mission? So we seek to protect human health by protecting the planet. Hmm. Okay, that's nice and short. Yeah. Tell me about this. The Paris Climate Agreement was signed, as we suggested in the intro, three years ago. We have seen, over that time, various governments around the world pulling back from the commitments that they made in Paris, most notably the United States, of course. We want to put some footage up. There we go. Look at that wall monitor over there. These are some protests in Paris, the so-called Yellow Vests protests. Uh, it has prompted the French government to delay the taxes that they had planned to put on fossil fuels. And I mean, I, I, I guess the, I want to get your take on the reality of today's politics, because the reality of today's politics suggests that people are tapped out when it comes to and, and are electing governments which are reducing the taxes on carbon that previous governments committed to years ago. How do governments recapture the enthusiasm for fighting climate change when this appears to be the prevailing political sentiment of the day? So we have a big communications problem around climate change. So for years, you know, we've mostly heard about carbon dioxide, what is carbon dioxide, some chemical, and you know, it's going up on these graphs. So we're asking people to change their behavior based on what's happening on a graph to a chemical. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I spend a lot of time asking people to stop smoking after a heart attack. And, and that's even sometimes tough, right? Mm -hmm. But we have a much better chance of getting people to change behavior or accept different changes if we can make it clear to them how it impacts their day-to-day -day life. So one of the reasons I spend as much time talking about health and climate change as I do is that there's evidence that when we show people what climate change means for them, for their bodies, for their health, for their kids, it, they're actually way more motivated to take action. So we know, for instance, so the International Lancet Climate Change Report that came out um, this last in November that this was associated with showed that we're already seeing decrease in crop yields in 30 countries making malnutrition the number one forecast likely health impact of climate change in the 21st century. We're seeing dengue fever uh, spreading across the world and increasing sort of 
the uh, probability of a given mosquito giving somebody dengue fever is called vectorial capacity. We're seeing increased heat-related illness. So um, in fact, billions of hours of work have been lost worldwide um, as particularly agricultural workers have just encountered temperatures so hot that they haven't been able to work. So that has both health and uh, economic consequences. And you know it makes it difficult for workers to gain the, the money that they need to support their families. So these are the kinds of things that make climate change make sense to people. And we need to start talking about climate change in those, in those factors. We've also been leaving most of the messaging around this to the people who are frankly the least trusted messengers. So I don't know if you've ever looked at- Who are at, the least trusted messengers? Unfortunately, if you look at like surveys of who are trusted messengers, politicians are at the very bottom. Hmm. And when you think about who talks about it, who's trying to uh, sort of unify people to take action on this, most of us will picture a politician. So meanwhile, actually at the top of the trusted messengers list is people, nurses are number one on most lists. Doctors are up there, scientists, hairdressers. So we, we've been talking about chemicals. We've been asking the wrong people to, to carry the message. Um, we need to start talking about climate change in terms of health, which is something that tends to bring people all onto the same page and unify people. We need to put people that are trusted messengers out and ask them to say, hey, like we need to do this for our health. Okay, in and these case, are the most important treatments. The people who have gathered in Poland, yeah. are they hairdressers or are they politicians? There are a lot of people in Poland. So this is picture the most giant conference that you have ever been to. So incredibly multidisciplinary. At ev any given time, you could be doing at least 50 different things. Um, it is it is a boggling place. So there are politicians. There, there are. There are diplomats. There, you were there. There are doctors. There are people in healthcare, obviously. There yeah. are environmentalists. There are business people. Business people. Scientists. Okay. Um, yes, it is. Uh, and from all sorts of different sectors. So everything right. from health to renewable energy to... Um, I was talking to people involved in carbon carbon bond trading, blockchain. Hmm. Um, yes, it, it is a boggling beehive of human activity. Are they getting anywhere? So I think it depends on what outcomes you're looking at. So, and and I I had this question too when I you know was watching from from home. And so so we want the outcome. We want to know okay, do we manage to negotiate the Paris rule book, which is what we're going to depend on to sort of set the rules and make sure things are transparent so that we can essentially implement the the Paris Agreement and. At, at, at the moment we're, we're speaking, we, we don't know what the outcome of that is. Mm -hmm. So that's one outcome. But meanwhile, there are many people there who don't participate in the negotiations at all. They may try to um, you know, influence a negotiator, but they're there to coordinate or to learn from somebody on the other side of the country who's also there at the, at the uh, talk. So for instance, I spent most of my time uh, coordinating with uh, medical students from across the world on a curriculum project. Mm -hmm as well as connecting with the rest of the climate change and health community to talk about, okay, how can we actually get health into what's called the NDCs or the Nationally Determined Contributions as a way to really inject health into sort of the meat of the framework um, and get everybody on the same page. So, so there's all sorts of things. So I think there's never going to be any one outcome that we're going to be able to evaluate because how are you, you know, if we manage to get climate change and health into the curriculum of every medical school worldwide, which was the point of my interactions there and is one of our recommendations uh, in, in our brief, that's huge because all of a sudden you have all of the doctors in the world understanding climate change, being able to frame climate in terms of health and being able to interact uh, in a distributed way with the decision makers in their country. And they are respected messengers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, let's just share with you here what Reuters reported a week ago. Uh, here we go. Coming from the conference, Maldives Environment Minister Hussein Hassan asked fellow ministers at the plenary to stand. There is no time to lose. Stand for a few moments and think about what will happen if we fail to save the planet now. He said. When you were there, did you get the sense that government officials, the decision makers, share that sense of urgency? It depends very much on the country. So uh, we know that the, the IPCC one and a half degrees Celsius report, it was presented before the COP and they were asked whether or not to welcome it or not. Welcome means we sort of accept what, what this said. And several countries said no. Uh, Saudi Arabia, for instance, uh, objected to that language. So they ended up as a group noting that noting it. So there are countries that have been more or less helpful in general, though, there's a tremendous sense of urgency. There's an escalator, actually, uh, that you kind of had to go up in order to get to the rest of the COP. And at the bottom, there was this big chart that said, what if we don't meet the one and a half degree target? And there was a picture of a thermometer and it went one and a half degrees, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, five degrees, six degrees. And you could just see everybody as they were going up this escalator, kind of looking at this, be like, ah, 
there is a lot of pressure on these people here. Mm -hmm. And I, there was a tremendous sense of, of urgency. And so I think that most of the people who are there really care. But of course, the ministers are curtailed by whatever the policies are back at home, and they can only offer what they're allowed to offer. And so it is important, I think, for us to be, um, you know, increasing the sense of uh, sort of uh, need for urgent action there, but a lot of it has to do with what space we create back at home for our political leaders to do what needs to be done. Having said that, uh, I, you know, let me just show you this here. I got this list here of all the, <clears throat> the yeah. countries that are represented and how many delegates they bring, right? So here's Guinea, number one. They got, you know, 400 plus delegates. Democratic Republic of the Congo, 230 some odd delegates. Poland, it took place in Poland, so they had a lot. Cote d'Ivoire, Indonesia, you know, a, a lot of the places that bring a lot of delegates to this thing are not the places where th that are overwhelmingly responsible for climate change, mm -hmm. which is North America, China, India, etc. So, you know, one wonders whether this deck is a bit stacked. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, so what what you've what you've said is true, and there's this great map by Dr. Jonathan Patz, who's one of the key researchers in climate change and health, and he basically has it's sort of a map on of the world on top and a map of the world on the bottom, and so the map on top is uh, the countries that have produced the most greenhouse gases. So basically, the country size expands the more greenhouse gases it's produced. Okay. The bottom is the, this is where the health impacts of climate change are going to be felt. And so the countries sort of, you know, they get big if there's going to be, you know, a lot of malnutrition, a lot of floods, a lot of droughts, mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, vector-borne disease, and they get smaller if they're going to be relatively safe. And so it's pretty much an exact opposite. Right. So in the top... The, the, the um, countries that are responsible for it yeah. are going to have the smallest impacts. Yeah. The countries that are not responsible for it are going to have the biggest impacts. Yeah, and in yeah. terms of health, too. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, from an ethical standpoint, it, it's... We, we need to take that into account. And so it's fair the, that they send a lot of people. I, I think so, yeah. yeah, because they, you know, the Lancet uh, Countdown Report, the international one, um, if you take a look at its maps too, and so they have a good one for, for floods and droughts, and they have a good one for um, uh, extreme weather and heat, you know, it, it's inevitably the countries that have contributed the least that are, that have the most impacts. And because they, these are often countries that don't have a well-developed um, health system in the first place, they also have the least ability to adapt. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we know here, even in Canada, um, you know, for instance, our wildfires out west, so we're seeing an increase in extreme wildfires. And that, ref, you know, Fort McMurray Hospital had to evacuate in an hour. And they managed to somehow in the matter of like several hours evacuate an entire hospital system. Imagine the amount of logistical know-how that requires. Mm. And imagine trying to do that in the middle of, you know, the Congo. But let me ask you about this country's commitment to, to doing something about this. Three years ago in Paris, Canada sent almost 400 delegates to that convention. We had 126 this time. What do you infer from that? Well, what people were saying is that because this COP was so focused on the rule book, there just would be less people come. Um, and I don't think it helped, frankly, that it was in Poland in early December. Gotcha. <laughs> we had trouble getting people from the health community there, too. I understand. Yeah. Okay, let me read this tweet here. This is from Catherine McKenna, the Minister of the Environment for Canada, and uh, she had the following to say. We are the first generation to broadly experience the impacts of climate change. We are the first generation to understand the solutions and have a commitment to each do our part. We are the last generation who can prevent the worst effects. So let's do it. Hashtag COP24. On the other side, you have some in the environmental movement, for example, Bill McKibben, author of The End of Nature, who says that the annual COP meetings are not worth the effort because they, quote, produce insufficient results too slowly at a time when rapid action is demanded. What's your take on his sentiments? So first of all, I think Catherine McKenna is right. You know, I spend as much work on this uh, as I do because I'm an emergency doctor and I'm trained to respond in a timely manner to quick moving disease. And I have been in the situation where I have done that and I have taken somebody who had unstable physiology and managed to sort of pull them back into a place where they were stable. And it's a nice metaphor for what you have to do right now. Well, the, and it's actually very visceral. There are a lot of eMERGE docs actually increasingly becoming involved in this. And I think it's because we've all also unfortunately had the opposite experience, which is of having somebody semi-stable 
and then having them um, essentially as one organ system shuts down and then the next organ system shuts down and the next organ system shuts down. They crash. Yeah, exactly. So even if you give the same treatment that you could have given five minutes ago and it would have worked, if, if the, that's already started to happen, they just spiral out of your control and it doesn't matter what you've done. And can. then metaphor works for the planet as well. It feels like it is apt, yeah. And so those of us who spend our lives resuscitating biological systems are very, very, uh, we're unable to actually sit still right now because there's such a sense that the physiology of the planet is becoming unstable. So yes, it is time for us to act as urgently as we possibly can. This is this is a code blue for the planet. We need to walk quickly to the site of, of trouble and we need to have clear leadership. We need to have a clear plan that we communicate to everybody and we need to take action in a sustained way. Um, in a timely way. So, so that's why so many physicians are involved and I completely agree with that quote by Catherine McKenna. If we, what we do now, we have an opportunity to pull the planet out of that spiral from what we know. If we, you know, if our kids do the same thing in 20 years. Might be too late. Yeah. And so that's, that's why this is so important. So with regards to um, Bill McKibben, um, you know, if you're looking at it from the point of view of um, the negotiations, I could see how that would be frustrating if you're looking at it from the point of view of the hive of activity of different people from across the world meeting one another, having a multidisciplinary conversation, because we know we all live in silos, right? Mm -hmm. So this is one of the only places where I can reliably show up and go to a, you know, for instance, a uh, talk on um, renewable energy and battery storage put on by the best person in the world. Mm -hmm. And as, you know, as a doc working in this, we intersect with these energy um, areas, but we don't have formal training on that. So it's nice to be able to go and learn what you need to know. So I'm never gonna be the expert in energy. Uh, at CAPE, we work a lot with the Pembina Institute. So we've been very involved in the coal phase out uh, in Alberta and nationally. And so we produce reports that say, okay, well, this is how many asthma exacerbations a coal phase out will save. This is how much money that will save. Then they sort of take the other end of the report and overlap with us and say, okay, so what? given that, well, this is the type of like gas fired tur turbine that we need and the number of megawatts we need. So. So there's all sorts of opportunities for interaction at these conferences that um, you know yield results. I've been talking about uh, with Pemina, you know, potentially matching up different countries, the capes of those countries, the Peminas of those countries, and getting together and teaching them what we did, mentoring them around coal phase out. And those are the kinds of conversations you have there. You create the relationships that then allow you to pick up the phone later and be like, hey, remember that idea we talked about? Well, let's do it. And so there's a lot that happens that doesn't get sort of reported on. And to be honest, there's a lot of peer support because a lot of people are doing this work far from other people. Can I ask you about that? Just to, we yeah. got about a minute left to go here. Yeah. And, and speaking about doing the work, I wonder how when you go back to Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, and you are doing your job as an ER doctor, how, how can you bring all of what you've talked to us about tonight into your day-to-day -day work? So we do need to have an awareness of the mental health impacts of this on all of us. So one of the major things that people uh, took from our report was the this sense report. of... There we go. Uh, That's the report. You, of, you've seen yeah, this before? Yeah, of eco-anxiety. Thank you. Okay. Yes. yes. So yes, we recommended right. carbon pricing that report on behalf of Canadian mm -hmm. Medical Association and uh, the Canadian Public Health Association as one of the main treatments for climate change. Um, that's what The Lancet's been telling us for years. But one of the other things we talked about was the growing sense in Canada that climate change is landing in our bodies through these heat-related deaths, through the wildfires, through, through the tornadoes, it's feeling real to us. And that's making people feel worried. And so one of the things I do want to know, and you know, if this comes up in my clinical interactions, is it increasingly is, um, it's normal to feel worried. And the most productive thing that we can do with that worry is to talk about it so you don't have to at least feel lonely within your worry and then come together to create the solutions and all pull in the same direction. Like basically we're all in a canoe right now and we didn't ask for it, but we're in the middle of the rapids and we need to just paddle as fast as we can in the right direction to get us around the rapids in the right place. So I think talking about our growing concerns helps us get into the canoe, form a plan and paddle in the right direction. And I think that's what we can do. And that's what I'll be working on when I go home to Yellowknife. Gotcha. We are grateful that you spared some time for us on your way back from Poland uh, to home, and uh, good luck with your efforts. Thank you very much. That's Courtney Howard, President, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, and the co-author of the Lancet Countdown 2018 report, Briefing for Canadian Policymakers. Thanks, Dr. Howard. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. 
Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.